we ask you to fill this place and speak to us. Thank you that today we will be changed by your word. And whatever you have to say to us, we are ready to receive. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Would you lift your hands with me and let's pray for the Holy Spirit for a few seconds. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we thank you and we welcome you. We want to hear your voice, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts, change us. Descend upon us like rain, Lord. Rain on us, Lord. Love, divine, joy, unspeakable. We pray that you speak to us and fall on us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Tell two people I'm blessed to be in church. And you may be seated. Amen. Wonderful. And welcome to church. Are you alive? Well, I bring you greetings from Resistencia. Argentina but when when prophet said he was going to Argentina a lot of you are shouting I'll be there so I thought you'll be there but it seems you are here amen but it's been a wonderful time how many of you have been watching what God is doing in Resist, Resistencia I didn't even know there was a place like that but um, the church uh, prophet is preaching is the largest church in Argentina and um, the Lord is doing wonderful things there in Argentina. Amen. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of the videos. Yeah, we had a video of, Bishop Richard sent me a video of the people waving. I don't know what they were waving about last night. And I said, wow, the wave was very powerful. And um, I don't know if they have that video. Yeah, there we go. videos are all on YouTube. You can go to Dark Your Mills on YouTube and you can watch. Um, I think there are like four or five of them up now. And um, I know God is going to bless you. How many of you have been to Argentina before? No, no, not that you will be. I am searching for how many of you have been there before. Oh, but you are always watching Messi and other things. I thought by now... You'll be there in Jesus' name. So he sends his love. I spoke to him yesterday, again, always about the church. And I know his heart is on you. You know that your pastor really loves you. You have no idea. And I know that God is blessing us and moving us forward. Amen. So he'll be back very soon. And um, how many of you were blessed by the church growth message? Yeah, last week was something, eh? a blessing. Amen. And um, next week we are having Dr. Rodney Howard Brown here on Friday night, Saturday morning. He's here for six services. Six services. Six. Actually, do you have the video again? Is it possible? The video where he says he's coming to Ghana. If you have it, that would be good. But he's here for six. How many? So he'll be preaching at... Um, on Friday night, he's preaching. That'll be the opening night. So I want to encourage you to come. And I want you to encourage you to bring four people to come with you. And I know God is going to touch your life. Amen. Um, when Prophet was leaving, he told me, ask for Pastor Rodney. He's a Holy Ghost man. So I believe that the Holy Ghost is going to touch us and bless us. Oh, your amens are so weak. I was just at the Holy Ghost Encounter Service, so God really is alive there. So I don't know what you people are doing. It's always uh, very, I don't know. Hey, experience, I beg you. Can you be alive a little bit and show some life? It's so easy. 
Anyway, I don't know if we should change the name of your service. Maybe. I don't know. If you're, maybe you are too experienced. I don't know what it is, but it's very, the difference is too difficult because from the morning I came here. Hey. Anyway, it's hard. You there, try, okay? Tell your neighbor, try hard. Wake up. Lay hands on the person next to you and say, try and come alive. All right, play the video. Play, if you have the video, play the video. Why not? We are here. Okay. <laughs> There's no age restriction on this for the young and the old, for everybody. Just say this out loud, me no want little Holy Ghost. Me want big Holy Ghost. God falling all over this field. You don't have to wait to the end. You can receive it right now, right in your seat, right in your home. my love and greetings to all of you at First Love Church in Accra, Ghana. I'm so excited, my first time coming to Ghana, and I want to say, Pastor Joshua and Kiki, I'm looking forward to being with you in your awesome church for He Gave Gifts Under Men Conference, the 3rd through the 5th of March. I want to encourage everyone in that whole region, get as many people as you can there, and get people that are hungry for what God has. And I'm coming to bless you. I'm coming to impart to you what the Lord has given to me. I know it's going to be a phenomenal time. Can't wait to see you. Love you. Bless you. So we are blessed um, to have him with us, a special gift, amen. Um, you know, his ministry was marked with the man particular manifestation of laughter. And um, yeah, people laugh. He's a son of Kenneth Hagin. When he was 17 years old, he started listening to Kenneth Hagin. And he had a similar experience to prophet and something entered into him. And um, since he started preaching in his 20s, people laugh. It's, it's what happens. You know? And um, I don't know. If Kenneth Hagin had that, a lot of that. And that's how he was. And when he was, I think, 30 or 31 years old, Kenneth Hagin invited him to preach in his church. So he preached for six days. And Kenneth Hagin was sitting there. He said it was the most difficult preaching he's ever preached. But Kenneth Hagin was sitting there 
So it's an old anointing. He used to preach with Oral Roberts in the Maybe Center and Oral Roberts University. And this is his first time in Ghana. He's been invited to Ghana many times. And he said he didn't feel led by the Holy Spirit, but he wants to come to the First Love Church to be a blessing. So uh, it's going to be a strange, a strange weekend. You know, the Bible talks about the strange acts of God and the strange works of God. And so uh, you laugh. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is not in meat and in drink, but it's in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's quite funny to see. Because he himself, he really laughs. He's serious, but everybody's laughing around him. And uh, do you remember um, Evangelist Jonathan when he came here? Yeah, I was talking to him this week and he was telling me he went for a pastor's conference with Dr. Rodney is actually a spiritual father, one of his spiritual fathers. And he was saying that he went for a conference um, with his wife. And he said his wife started laughing and she laughed and laughed, fell on the floor. And like it was over, and your sister, he was trying to control her that they should go home. And so he, she laughed, he was trying to walk her to the car, she laughed and laughed and laughed. I mean, I saw the video. Uh, I saw the video of her, he actually put up the video, which is quite cheeky, but he put up the video of her laughing. So I don't know what's going to happen here, but I tell you, the power of the Holy Ghost, the wine of the Holy Spirit. So come early, and also, when you come, come and sit in front. Don't let any outsider... You know, yesterday one of one of our uncles, yesterday one of our uncles from the UD caught me at a, an event, and he told me that. So am I saying that I can't find a few minutes for him to come and preach in his church for just a short time? He said he used to watch him on TV and when he was younger. So can I not find a few minutes? And I said, I asked Dr. Rodney, what about another church? He said, No, only first. Any other church, he will not even come. So I really want you to come early Friday. And the, we have to stick to the preaching time because it's six services. So Friday, we start at 7. By 8 o'clock, you'll be on stage, on the door. So I want you to come and come early. I want you to come and sit in front. Amen. Oh, give me an amen. And I know God is going to bless us. I'm going to be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Laughter. You laugh. Uh, Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. So I don't know how it works. I've not really seen one like that before but i tell you it's going to be fantastic amen so I, i'm looking forward to seeing that now he's here on friday evening okay that's the opening night that's the big bonanza opening night on friday night so make sure you're here then on saturday morning he's going to anoint and pray for people on saturday morning 10 o'clock then on saturday evening at the gospel encounter service he will be preaching so if you can me i'm here for all six it's up to you then, and also if you are bashing, sometimes it's good to come for the service you are not bashing for so that you are a little relaxed. Are you with me? So Saturday evening he's preaching. Then Sunday morning, Holy Ghost Encounter Service, he's preaching in the morning. Then in the afternoon, he's preaching at Experience. Then in the evening, he's preaching at Revival. So it's six, six services. So I told him, he said, Lord, we should make it three. It's easier. We'll be okay. Three services. He said, if I do anything less than six, then he's canceling the program. So I said, okay. So he wants to come and preach to every service plus one. Amen. And I know it's going to be a blessing for you. Oh, I don't feel your excitement. Or... Wonderful. So it's a blessing. And um, I know God will change your life. You know, these things happen... Um, once in a while. I was talking to him and I told him that he should relax and that next time he comes, we can do some of the other things. He said there may never be a next time. He said he can't think of himself coming. He doesn't know why you come to Ghana again. He doesn't know what. We never know. He said there are so many places to go before he dies. So he doesn't know. So this may be the one and only time. You never have many of these experiences. So I believe God will touch you. God will bless you. And God will speak to you. Amen. Now, uh, today I want us to, I'm not going to preach for a short time. Um, I, I said I'm not going to preach for a short time. But it was a mistake. I meant to say I'm going to preach for a short time. All right. Now, I want to share with you on soul winning. Amen. And today I want to share with you on why Philip preached Christ. Why Philip preached Christ. Amen. 
Please, are you there or you've gone home? Okay, okay, okay. Relax, I'm just asking. Just checking. Now, um, I believe that soul winning is the important, as Bishop Oedipo process, is the way to maintain relevance in, in, in the ministry or in, in God, I believe. And I believe that our church, you know, our prophet started this church by going around having carnival of stars. Okay, where he will let people sing on stage and he'll preach at hostels with different groups. Uh, midnight girls, is the one I remember. I know people who were midnight girls, don't mention it. And then uh, I think even Pastor Frank was a singer at some point. Um, but he was a star. <laughs> he was he was just a tenor. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And what about Bishop Paul? He was in the choir. He didn't make it as a star. Okay, I don't. I think I don't know the history well. He was a worshiper. Okay, but they were stars, you know. And he would preach salvation, salvation messages every night, Sunday evening. I went for some of those, and then. Um, Madam X was the, uh, the MC. And then there was somebody else. Ice Bay, yes, Ice. And then ATO, yes. So when I, when, I, when I came to First Love Church in Ghana, I asked her, why is she called Madam X? I don't understand. She said, it is just a name that came. <laughs> That's what she was called. But I'm trying to say that the whole church was started because of the heart of Jesus Christ, which is to win souls. The reason why Jesus Christ came to the earth. Amen. And I believe that we must not switch or change or diminish. And I also want to say, you know, there is a difference between gathering somebody to church and converting a soul. You know, the Bible speaks about converting a sinner. That you actually see somebody whose life has changed because you spoke to the person and you brought the person to Christ. You know, there's a difference between adopting a child and giving birth to a child. Yes. You know, like some people in Ghana, when I say adopt, I don't even mean like legal adoption is like having a child. But I'm saying like, you know, some people just say, oh, this, oh, it's my child. Oh, it's my son. It's my, even me, I have a lot of people who come in, in this area. I have a lot of people here. I tell them, I tell them oh, but you are our father. And they also say, yes, this is my son, this is my son. But they don't really do in the area, talking about this area, owners of certain things, when I need them for help, or other neighbors, I call them my father, this, was, this is my son. Are you with me? But they don't really do what a father is really supposed to do, but it's more of an honorary title. Are you there? You've gone home. But giving birth to a child, and then the child is looking at you for everything that they need, is a little different. And as first lovers and as Christians, we must have people that when they were born again, they are looking at you to show them to how to read the Bible, show them how to pray, how to follow God. And that you are the one who actually led them to Christ. That is something. And that is what maintains your relevance, your greatness, and your importance. I remember when Billy Graham died, I was watching the funeral procession with my father and he was saying that I think we were yeah we were in Mampo I think and he was saying that look at the greatness of Billy Graham and his message was only one in fact Billy Graham never preached for more than 30 minutes rarely will you get a, a one hour message or 30 minutes 35 28 minutes 27 minutes and he had the simplest topics God commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is his message for today. Who is Jesus? When he was at the end of his life, he, he had his final crusade in the Yankee Stadium. My auntie was there. And he sat on stage, but he couldn't stand because he was in a wheelchair. And the pulpit was like a desk instead of a pulpit. And he sat and he preached, who is Jesus? And when he finished, the whole of Yankee Stadium was full. And he did the altar call. And thousands of people coming down to give their lives to Christ. Now you ask, what, what makes you relevant or great? There's no other pastor in the world that I know 
who the American Congress and the Senate will close down. Even Ghana Parliament may not easily close down for a pastor. And the President of the United States, and they, and they, they said something on CNN, they said 90-something um, percent of the Congress and the Senate have sat at a Billy Graham crusade to hear him preaching. Oh yes. And what is he coming to preach about? This is your year of beloved. No, no. Beloved spree. I heard one pastor saying that this year there's a beloved spree. Receive a spree of beloved. That was not the message. Neither did he come and preach about how you're about to get a promotion at work or you're about to receive a breakthrough. You know, but what is exciting in the church, okay, is if you, if you, there are certain messages that are generally exciting. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Even to me, there are some messages that are exciting. I mean, when you see some people preaching, you feel that, wow, this is something that's great. And the church is more impressed. Even you people, you'll be more impressed by certain things if they were to happen. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, if, I, if it was, there, there are certain areas of ministry which are naturally more scintillating. Uh, oh, you don't get what I'm saying? Yes, if I, if I now say that, there are four sisters here. There are four. Uh, Elam, Michelle, Akosia, Joanna. You are sisters. You are, you are all from the Volta region. You are from Hohoi. Ah, there they are. Oh, you people, you know, it's the walk, it's the walk there. You immediately, you sense some excitement or that something great is happening. I'm standing at, I'm in Dansuman. I'm at Dansuman Roundabout. I hear, keep fit. Keep fit. The roundabout is behind me. And keep fit is on my right. When I turn left, two houses down, on the right, there's a black gate. John Mensah lives there. John Mensah, where are you? God has located. Ah, there. Uh -huh. Then you hear, prophesy. I feel it. You know, one day I watched the pastor preaching him. And he was sharing verses. He started about five minutes. He was preaching. And he said, you know, the preaching is not working. It's not working. He closed the Bible. Let's prophesy. Yeah. Let's prophesy. Yeah. <laughs> you see, it's more exciting. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's more exciting. It's a more exciting topic. It's your phone here. <laughs> not the Vodafone, the MTN. Yeah. The 0243-617-724. Is it here? Check it. There's more on it. It's 700. You people don't understand the prophetic. You don't understand the prophet. It's the walk. No, me, the walk. You don't understand the prophet. Oh, yes. If you add, if you add a tree song, my God. Immediately. Wow. What I'm saying is that I meet too. I also know it is more exciting. It's more excited, it's more, it's more, it's more, it feels more like something powerful or something. And I, and I like it and it's, it's good, it's wonderful, it's supernatural, it's the anointing, it's powerful, it's the Holy Ghost, we thank God. And, I, 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 and it, it's more in tune with what, what you need. Oh yes, there's a girl here. There's a girl here. No, no, she's not on this side, she's on this side. I can see the wedding. I can see the altar. The flowers are pink and white. Ah, the wedding is on TV. Sarah Coomson, come to me. Sarah Coomson, come to me. She's on the ah, that's Sarah. Ah, that's it. Immediately, it's more exciting. Yes. Or if it's 31st night. And it's time to declare the theme of the year. Oh, yes. And you've come. Oh, yes. The theme of the year is so winning. And it's not that it's not a good theme. It's a wonderful theme. But when you look at the church, you look at what people need. I mean, if I look at this front row here, 
One, two, hi, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My God, these eight people. The last message I should, I'll ever think about is so winning. The last topic of preaching, if, if these are the people. So when you are passed after some time, when you are even thinking of what to preach, and you remember the front row faces, immediately the thought that comes to your mind is, hey, let's preach about beloveds. Four ways to be chosen. But we organized uh, our wedding uh, marriage seminar here. I asked Reverend Kwesi, that Reverend Kwesi, please, I beg you. The attendants, we, we are not passing, we are not. He told me, oh, am I new? I should not know why. I should attend, and that's the least of my worries. That day, no bus. No bus center leader. No arrivals. No mobilization. Attendance is what? Love attendance. Love. Because we are coming to talk about love. How to be chosen. Favor. Favor. Yeah, that's the word that we like in, in Ghana. Favor. The oil of favor. The oil of favor. I, I told one of my daughters. I told her, you are 31. Beautiful girl. You have not been chosen. These are altars. And the altars must be broken. You know, some people are good at preaching. Some people are into baptism. I hear others writing books. I'm a prophet. We break altars. Come on, lift your right hand. Shout yes. It's more. You see, you are more blessed. You are more blessed. It's more. Yeah, it's more ahead. But I tell you something. I tell you something. The heartbeat of Jesus Christ is I came, Luke 19, verse 10. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, Philip the Evangelist, I'm preaching for a very short time. We have almost ended. Philip the Evangelist in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 4. He went down into Samaria to have a program to preach. And I'm, I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm a pastor. So when I, I can imagine the tension that Philip had. Now, Philip was not one of the top ap, uh, apostles and disciples. He was on the bench. He was not one of the 11. You know, there were 12. Judas died. And even when they were choosing somebody to replace Judas, Philip didn't, there were names mentioned. His name didn't even come up in the list. But they organized this big crusade. And I'm sure when they were sharing where to preach, the main places in Jerusalem where there were good venues, they didn't let Philip go there. So they sent him to dirty Samaria. You see, Samaria was a place where when King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel and took uh, the Israelites into captivity, the few ones that were left, they went into that region called Samaria to escape from his army. And in that area, they married the people who were there and became half-breeds. The Jewish people called them half-breeds. Okay, so there's a lot of racism. You see, these are the topics of pastors today. Race, because when you look at it, you say racism, uh, something life, some lives matter, I, which are all, we thank God for all these things, but I'm saying all these are not the reasons why Jesus came. So when Philip was faced with the prospect of preaching, you know, I, I am still nervous every time I'm going to preach. I'm still tense. It's, yesterday I had preached one of the most tense places I've ever preached because it wasn't easy. I was at a wedding that Charlie. The, the, the innumerable company of angels that was there, it was serious I had to preach looking straight, there was a big uh, color red on my right, I had to look straight and preach so we are all, I mean most people are still tense when you have to come and stand in front of people to talk, and everybody who preaches wants to hear amen any pastor who tells you that he wants to preach to silence he's not telling the truth everybody wants to, people to say wow I was blessed Everybody wants to say, Charlie, what a word. You know, you got a gift. You got a gift of preaching. Wow. He said, somebody said he's the, he's the prince of preachers. Oh, yes. Yes. Everybody will like those terms, the prince of preachers. Wow. Everybody will like people to say, wow, I'm blessed. Everybody likes to say, whenever he comes to a church, he shakes the church. Everybody will like people to be fighting over their face towel. I wonder if, if I had a face towel, I would like people to fight over my face towel. So Philip was tense. What should I go and preach? What should I talk about? I'm saying first love church, we have one topical. And our topic is Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
That's our main topic. That's what we go out to every street, every door preaching. So Philip went down into Samaria, the Bible says, and his topic was Jesus Christ. To people who are struggling with racism, poverty, Samaria is poorer than Israel. People who are struggling with a lot of sin. You remember the woman uh, with the, the multiple arrangements? Yes. Do you remember the 10 lepers from Samaria? The place of decadence. And his topic was one, Jesus Christ. And the question is, why did Philip preach? Why did he preach Jesus Christ? Or why do we, First Love Church, why is our message Jesus Christ? To everybody, why, why is that the emphasis of our church? That's why I said the church started. Do you understand? Look, the first time I went for Healing Jesus Crusade was in... Uh, Second show, the first crusade I ever attended. I mean, there were some Ghana ones generally. I was, I mean, you know how it is. But the first crusade that I can, I can relate with, yeah, yeah, was in Second show. Second show. It's in the, I think it's in the north of Senegal. I think so. All I know is that you drive for a long time. After you land in the capital, you drive, uh, uh, and you get there. Look, I almost gave my life to Christ. My God. This, the, me that I've come with the, the so I was wearing the healing Jesus uh, shirt with the orange. I almost, I almost dedicated my life to my God. The message, the message was Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Healer. I will never forget. I was on the at the back of the stage. I said, my God, the message, the Savior and the Healer. I started asking myself, am I saved? You see, what I'm trying to say is that what makes you a great minister? And I remember that day, Prophet stood on stage and he said, Jesus is a Savior and a Healer. He said, and if He doesn't heal today. He's not the son of God, God and all of us are liars. So, I hope I take your time. Well, this is not a crowd. Relax. Take your time. Oh, yes. What a, what a wonderful night that was in Ziggin Shaw. Ziggin Shaw, Senegal. I'll never forget. Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Healer. And that's the same way Philip went down in Samaria. The way Bishop Dag went down into Ziggin Shaw. And there was only one message. He didn't go and tell them that God is about to improve the economy. Look, the city... All those trying to save the city, eh? it's not savable. The city is not, and it's not saving. Thank you, it's not saving. All those trying to save the economy, eh, it's not going to be saved. The economy, it's not going to be, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to be saved. But Jesus Christ, the Lord has made him a prince and a savior. He's the, he's the savior of the world. Matthew 1, 21 says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he came to save the people from their sins. So Philip went down into Samaria and he preached Christ. Why did Philip preach Jesus Christ? I have a very short sermon today. Number one, Philip preached Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Uh, you want to sit down? You want to stand? Oh, you can sit down. You can sit down. Sit down. Or you stand down, we'll all be tired. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery? This is a mystery among the Gentiles, which is Jesus Christ in you. Oh, I'm blessed already. Is the hope. You understand? The possibility of glory. Now, what's glory? Glory is a high level of honor and beauty. Something to be celebrated and something to be admired. And what does this verse say? Now, if Jesus is in you, do you understand? It doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, or what you have done. If Jesus Christ is inside of you, then there is hope for something wonderful in your life. For all of you who are, you know, in my family we were four. All my siblings were more intelligent than me. All of them. I mean, when I learn hard, I've told you before, when I learn hard, when I say I learn, I mean, I take all the homework books and all the classwork. You know homework book? I don't know if you know homework book. Homework book, classwork book. I take all and I learn the whole book. I don't sleep. Night after night, class three, class four, class five. Class. When I learned, the highest I was ever able to be was ninth. In my life, ninth. Oh, are you saying mercy? It's not bad, but ninth is also not that bad. I mean, mercy is quite strong to apply. Our first ten, top ten. Anyway, in a class of only 27, I'll be 9. Then if I don't learn, I'll be 12. But my brother, when he doesn't learn, 5th. When he learns, 3rd. 
fifth, third, fifth, third, fifth, third, fifth, third. And my sister also came. Then my other sister also came. Child and shark, so A's, 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 these words, you know? Me, ninth and twelfth. Ninth and twelfth. Nothing. When I was in church, I used to play instruments. First, I started out as a drummer. So I was drumming. You know, you know, so when you are drumming, they say you should count to four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, two, 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 two. one, two, good. Now the problem was that my right leg and my right hand, they couldn't detach. So when my right hand does this, the leg also goes with it. And I couldn't seem to separate. So one day, my pastor just came and then because of me, he had a revelation. He said that there are diverse, that's the first time I heard that thing. There are diverse gifts, diverse operations, diverse administrations, but it's the same Holy Spirit. So, for example, he just said, for example, maybe Joshua, maybe he may not be good at drumming, but there are many other gifts that Joshua can do. Do you understand? Yes. So, they moved me from drums to piano. Wow. That was there. Then, before I see, they've changed the key. Now, there's something called transpose. Okay? Transpose is some buttons on the key, but when you press press, it automatically changes the key, so you just keep going. Okay, one day I want to play with this pianist here. So I was there, and then I asked them, where is transpose? Oh, anathema. They don't transpose. These people, they don't transpose. They don't believe you. change keys with your hands. And Pastor Michael, like, that's not allowed transpose. So they don't, they don't use any, tr- whatever you sing, they just follow them. Look at what they are doing. <laughs> yeah, so, whenever they move keys, then I'll now be searching to find which key they have moved to. Another revelation came. That, in, to be in church, you have to learn many things. You don't only have to, <laughs> you only have to know one thing. He said that, just, see, you have to know how to preach, you have to know how to go on outreach, you have to know how to play piano, you have to know. So they moved me to the bass guitar. It was me and my friend. His name was David Dawson. He was the lead guitarist at the bass guitar. So, I was the choir bass guitarist. So one day, there was a particular song that was being sung. Uh, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my... Then the, some tenors didn't come. So they needed some people to sing tenor. So I volunteered. Just to help. Charlie, when David was saying, held the bass guitar, everybody knew I should never play again. The lead guitarist, oh my God, what he played. Oh no, David was saying, David was saying, my God, he played the bass. Me now. So after, every time we sang that song, I have to give out the bass and go and sing with the choir. Because there was nothing glorious about me. But when Jesus Christ came into my life, when Jesus Christ came to live in my heart. You know, when I was in secondary school, when I was in secondary school, one day I was in morning assembly, and I was asleep. Yeah. I was asleep where the choir sits, okay. at the back, lying down and asleep. And I felt somebody tap me. What's going on? He said, they are calling you. So who's calling me? The headmistress is standing at the pulpit of the a great chapel, and she's mentioning Joshua Heward Mills. Where are you, Joshua, in the whole school? Joshua Heward Mills, where are you? I woke up. Yeah. Then they called me. Then they said, for being found in the wrong place at the wrong time on Wednesday, and whatever the, then they had me just and they said, and you are always getting in trouble. You, Joshua Heward Mills, you are always getting in trouble. And they made me stand in front of the school. That day, you know what I remember is hearing my name mentioned in full. Joshua Heward Mills. Joshua Heward Mills. Joshua Heward. You've done it in Joshua. And I was alone. Standing. Whole school. I mentioned all the things I've done. Oh. It was disgraceful. But you know, hard guy. So. I remember, you know, I felt so ashamed. Mm. On Friday, I was in Collegolong, and they mentioned Joshua Heward Mills. 
But this time they were introducing me to come and preach. I was in Collegono for a gospel, gospel crusade. And the people stood up when they mentioned we were here with Joshua Heward Mills. The people, I heard my name again, Joshua Heward Mills. And the people stood up and they started clapping as I was going to the pulpit. Now, why are they clapping? Is it because of my education? Is it because of my height? Is it because of my family? Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. He'll make your life beautiful. He'll make your life honorable. That's why we preach Christ. That's why we preach Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. It's the hope of the world. It's the hope of the world. What hope do we have? What hope do we have? Sometimes we are, sometimes I'm preaching. And as I'm preaching, I myself, I can see that. Somebody, somebody hold it. I can see that. My dear, this way. Go this way. Hey, this church. <laughs> Christ in here is the hope of glory. I can see that the people I'm preaching to, there's no hope. There's no hope. I, one day I sat here when we started the church and the whole place was a construction site. There was blood. We didn't have time. I remember sitting here doing counseling. You know, I had not had not seen something. And I had one of the other pastors sitting by me. And I remember as the girl started talking, I've never heard some before. She said, I went to um, one of these um, polytechnics and I went to do a course in something, something. And I said, okay. So I said, are you a Christian? How is your faith? I was just doing normal pastoral course. She said, no, I'm not a Christian. She said, I gave my life to Christ two weeks ago. She just started crying. She said, Oba, why am I so happy you giving life? She said, as I've given my life to Christ, I don't know how I'll go to school. I said, why? I said, because I sleep with men. I think it's either in Takwa or I forgot to know. I said, that is how I pay my school fees. Every time. I said, are you serious? So I said, how old are you? 19. So when did you start? I said, when I was around 15. Said, That's how I've paid my school fees. So I said, how long have you been doing this? She said, I don't know. I remember asking, and then my assistant pastor was unprofessional. So he was saying, heesh. <laughs> heesh. <laughs> you know, when you're a pastor, my father told me that a pastor is like a doctor. You never show surprise. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, pastor. And then I fell in love with the cow. Okay. And I slept with the cow. All right, that's fine. Okay. You, slept with the, that, you are supposed to keep a straight face, no matter what the person says. And my father told me, like a doctor, you don't respond. So I said, how many people have you slept with? She said, I can't count. And then my assistant pastor, if I was very unprofessional, so he said like more than 100. He asked me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I don't do those type of counseling, it's, 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 it's wrong. I just look at the child and say, there's no hope. There's no hope. We feel there's no hope. What do you do? How can you help? I spoke to a young man. He's in his 30s. He said his father advised him to go to university when he was 18. Fought with his mother, fought with his father, fought with everybody. Now he's uneducated at 31. Mm. And he's homeless and he has HIV. Hope. Show me hope. Show me hope. All of us have such people in our families. All of us know it's hopeless. It's hopeless. What is the hope? The hope is Jesus Christ in you. The hope is Jesus. Somebody told me, my, my, my father... My father has been diagnosed, my father was diagnosed with cancer in his neck, which I've never heard of before, neck cancer, but it's really, it happens. And when he went for the scan, they found cancer in four other places. So she said, we've come home. And it's like, they're saying that even to treat, the, because of where the different parts, like where do you even start? And, and there are different stages. What do you say? You get a beloved. You get a job. No. There's hope in one name. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other than in the name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is hope. Jesus Christ is hope for healing. Jesus Christ is hope for heaven. Jesus Christ is hope of comfort. Jesus Christ is hope for wisdom. Jesus Christ is hope. The Bible says in him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ is the light for us. He's the hope for us. That's why we have to go around everywhere in Accra. You know, next week, Next week, weekend is like an indoor crusade. We have to bring everybody that we know to find hope. You know, that word hope is, is something. You know, Billy Graham says, Winston Churchill asked him, do you have any hope? Because I don't have any. 
after working for many years to try and save the world, what hope is there? What hope is there? Do you have any hope for me? Is there anything that you can say that can bring me hope? What's the hope of glory? Your beloved is the hope of your glory. Your job. No. Jesus Christ. This is why we have one message. You know, I tell you, I've never felt more correct as a pastor than when I'm preaching. You know, I heard that he said, I never understood. He said, you never feel more in line. One day I heard that he preached on art of leadership. He said something I'll never forget. He was talking about, don't give up your source of power. 2012, you can see if you can find it. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, you know, as I'm preaching on leadership, I'm not sure of myself. He said, leadership is good and all that. And I, and I, I prefer... To stay, he was talking about the feet short with the preparation of the gospel. He said, I prefer to stay where I feel most in line with God when I'm preaching about the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. The cross of Jesus Christ. You know, I gave my life to Christ at the Kodesh. It was a Friday night in October 2009. And I told my father, I hope he's not listening. I hope I'm not live streaming. Hey, I hope so. Don't do that to me. You love me. Eh? Don't finish me before my time. I'm live, eh? Oh, then let me not tell the story. Yeah. Take your time. Resistential may be watching. Easy. But I gave my life to Christ that day. <laughs> yeah, I, remember, I, remember, I remember the words that, that um, Bishop Oko spoke. You know, he led me to Christ when I was nine or ten years old. But when I was about 14, I took my life back. You understand? I gave it life to Christ. I gave it, so I took it back. And when I was 19 and I gave it again, I'm never taking it back. But I remember when I was standing, I remember the words he said, come to the cross. And I was texting on my phone, I was not interested. I was on my way somewhere. Also, I had another, yeah, you understand? You understand things, yeah, 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 you know. It's not everything we can say. But I remember when he said, and I turned to my friend. My friend was standing next to me. I said, Charlie, I, the thing, I know we'll go again. I know we're going somewhere. I said, I know we'll go again. He said, then he was trying to even understand, you know, go where? I said, no. And I was the transport, so he was not happy at all. There were two of my friends. Uh, he's the one I was sitting by. And I said, that only three or four people came to give that. What was happening to me was glory. There was now new hope for my life. There was now a chance of something better and more beautiful. I don't, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you're a prostitute, if you're an alcoholic, if you're on drugs. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how many decisions you have taken, how far you have gone. When Jesus Christ comes to live in you, that's what the Bible says. It's a mystery. Colossians 1 27 says, it's a mystery amongst the Gentiles. It's, it's confusing. But when you insert Jesus Christ into someone, suddenly there's hope. Do you know what Air Force One is? Air Force One is the plane that carries the president. Now, a lot of people think that that big, I don't know if it's a 747, I don't know what it is, but that big plane, there are two of them, that that's Air Force One, but it's not true. Air Force One is any aircraft that the president sits on. It becomes Air Force One. And Marine One is any helicopter that the president sits on. It becomes. Then the beast is any car. So you may be driving a Hyundai accent. But if President Joe Biden sits inside, the Hyundai accent is now called the beast. You may have a, a AWA to Kumasi, but if President Joe Biden chooses to sit on AWA, immediately in all towers, they start to radio and say, Air Force One is taking off. You may have some small helicopter at 37, but if the president sits on it, immediately it's called Marine One. What I'm trying to say is that no matter how dirty your life is, when Jesus climbs into your heart, immediately there is hope for glory, there's hope for something beautiful. Your name in the spirit changes and your identity changes. That's why Philip went down into Samaria with one topic, Jesus Christ. I can't think of a better sermon. Me, I've been nervous many times. That's why I don't like preaching in other people's churches. I don't know how I'll preach. At least here, I know that if it's not working, I'll say, Chai, people say amen from here. <laughs> other people say, I get, I get too nervous. I don't like it. I can't sleep. I'll be in a hotel room. I can't sleep. Waking up, I, I'm drinking coffee every day. I need to wee-wee every five minutes. It's too much for me. I can't take it. Because when you are thinking of what to be, and I'm sure Philip was wondering, what should I talk about? What will be powerful? What, what will the people, what will bless the people? What to, what to impress the people. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, preach about me. Jesus Christ and him crucified. To the Jews, it's, it's a stumbling block. And to the, to the Gentiles, it's foolishness. But to us who are saved, 
It's the power of God. It's the power of God, the gospel. And I want each of you to learn how to explain. I like the way that he said that. He said, you have to learn how to explain the gospel. You have to learn how to explain the gospel. You have to learn how to tell the story of the gospel. That's why daddy wrote that book, How to Preach Salvation. Oh, it's a beautiful book. Every, every, everybody must. That's what the Bible says. The full armor of God is the feet short with the preparation of the gospel. Every first lover must have five messages that if I wake you up. Yeah. Hey, go. Let's go. John 3.16, you start. Number two. Number one. Um, God. 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 For God. No, no, no. First message, title. John 3.16. Two. Um, number your days. Three. Um, uh, life, death, judgment. Four. Um, uh, number five is... Um, we are on four, bro. Consider, consider, come, let us consider. The reason. Let us reason together. Okay, that's four. You, number one. <laughs> number one. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Number two. Number two. The handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall. Number three. Number three. For God did not send His Son to the world to condemn the world. Number four. God commended His love for us. Number five. Greater, Greater love. love. Beautiful. Number one. Number your days. Number two. Without. Number three. Jesus and blind Bartimaeus. Number four. Jesus and the noble man's son. Number five. Jesus and the man with the withered hand. Beautiful. Number one. Hey, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> Are you running away? Hey, should we go into some Christians? I want you to be master soul winners. Master soul winners. You have to learn the sheep and the goats. You know, I heard a Billy Graham preach a message, a more convenient time. A more convenient time. I never heard some before. A more convenient. I was wondering, what message is this? Then he quoted Acts 24, 24. Acts chapter 24, verse 24. Hello, hello, help us. After certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul. And he heard Paul concerning the faith in Christ. So he said, he has come. So some of you came here with your wives, your friends, and you have come to hear my message on Jesus Christ. Then 25, hello, and as he reasoned righteousness, temperance, and judgment, he said, Felix trembled. And he told the people, many of you are trembling in this arena as I'm preaching. You are shaking as I'm preaching. And then he said, and you say to me, go away for some time. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. A more convenient time. Wow. Never seen it before. I heard prophet preach a message called True Riches. Yeah, at a breakfast meeting to businessmen, true riches, true riches. I said, Wow, I thought it was a business seminar. When he started, to, I thought we were going into economy. Hey, before I realized the hot, hot salvation is heated. Oh, yes, what about you? I don't know if I should ask. Number one, number your days, number your days. You are copying, no? number two, um, God commanded his love. You are copying, number three. Without your copy, number four. Yeah, Gomez, number one. The great invitation. The great invitation, number two. Jesus Christ is blind by tears. Jesus Christ, your copy, number three. Jesus Christ is the woman of the world. Number, mm, number four. Come on, my friends. Come on, my friends. We need master soul winners in church. Master, receive the grace. The Bible says, after the Holy Spirit comes on you, become a witness. Hey, we have to have a church of witness. I'm sending you, everybody, go and study five topics. Five topics. Jesus Christ, the hope of... Uh, if there's even a message called Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Yeah. Only that one. There's another message called Jesus will do you good. Right. Jesus will do you good. There's a message called without without number one you, there are things you cannot do without number one without faith it's impossible to please God number two without holiness you cannot see God number three without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins fourth three points you are done oh you don't get what I'm saying yes. Jesus is anointed for you seek ye the Lord while he may be found prepare to meet your God then there are some other unknown ones silence in heaven there's a message called silence in heaven there's a message called uh, the dead dog. The dead dog. And there's a message called your bed is too short. <laughs> or you are too nice to perish. 
Yes, there's something called a famous conversation. This is a master soul winner. I'm telling you, you have to learn how to explain salvation. This is the work of a Christian. Why Philip preached Christ? There's another one called Zion Train. Mm, Zion Train. The story of the cross. Oh, God is going to anoint you to be a soul winner. God is going to anoint you. Why Philip preached Christ? Number two. You know I'm only on number two. Sit down. I have three points that we close. Number two. We preach Christ because he's the light of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He, the one who follows me, will never walk in darkness. He will have the light of life. Look at it. The light of life. Jesus is the light of this life. In this life, without Jesus, you know, me, my, my small toes, the two of them, I don't expose them in public. Because what they have been through over the years, they are so mutilated that they can never be normal again. They have hit door, door, uh, door edges. They have hit tables, chairs, bottles. Uh, my car door has been closed on it. Yes. All because of walking in darkness. When you walk in darkness, you always hurt yourself. Have you banged your knee? You know, those type of pains, you can't explain it. Look, one day I hurt my toe. Eh? Look, I was with my wife. I hurt my toe. I, 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 I couldn't, my God, I couldn't hold myself. Here, I sat on the floor holding my leg. Scream my little toe. I was screaming. My wife thought I was dying. I told her, I'm not far from death, mom. <laughs> My mother-in-law heard me shouting and she told my wife, that's where, that's where my daughter gets it from. That's why she's also always shouting. Oh, I thought it wasn't easy for me. I shouted for a long time, screaming because of a small pain. And that's how we are when we don't have Jesus in our lives. We are, we are trying things out. We are trying something out. That's how, that's how people have so many heartbreaks. Should I told one of my church members, you'll be happy again. So I don't think so. Because of the heartbreak. Since you were 17, you've been walking in darkness. But when Jesus comes into your life, have light. You know, I love what I love what the scripture says in John chapter 1. It says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Like his life is light for us. When we don't know what to do, we look at the life of Jesus Christ to know what to do. Jesus Christ shows us how we should be. When you come to Jesus, suddenly you know. You know, you never knew you were proud. No one ever used that word on you till you came to Jesus. You never knew you were a liar until you came to You never knew you were not nice until you came to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ comes to somebody's life, he's light. You know, my cousin, um, Emmanuel, he's here, Pastor Emmanuel. When I was in university, I didn't have money. I needed a place to stay. So I wanted to, I didn't want to pay rent. So I went to stay in his flat. But his flat was maybe from me to where Pastor Gomez is. Like this a square. In it is a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. This small square. Four bathroom. And I'm his older cousin, I'm also his pastor. But he made me sleep on the floor. But that's a that's a discussion for another day. So for almost two years I was sleeping on the floor as he was on the bed, saying, Are you okay? So one day, I told him I've had enough. I'm renting another place down there, even if it's expensive, it's too much. So I went to this other flat that I've moved into, also another small square like that. And I was sleeping there, but it's more personal, you know, and I don't have to sleep on the floor. I mean, show some respect, you know. So anyway, one night. I was sleeping and I felt a presence in the room. So, oh. so is this a rejoiner moment? What's going on? Is something uh, is the spirit world trying to communicate with me? So I wasn't sure. So I got up. So look. So here I am, Lord, speak. Kiss. And I didn't hear. Anything. So I turned on the light. There was no one in the room. I said, oh, you know, Job said I, I, there was a presence and the hairs on my skin stood. So sometimes you can't see, 
Although we can't see him, we believe in him. And so I said, oh, maybe it's the Lord. And then, the next day, I put some KFC on the counter. No, drumsticks. Drumsticks. I believe in drumsticks. The closer to the bone, the better. So I put drumsticks down. And I went downstairs to receive a delivery and when I came back up, I noticed that somebody has bit in fact, what I'm about to tell you, are the first people I'm ever admitting this thing to. And I thought that maybe I bit it. So I even, I, I continue, I don't, I, I can't even, I don't even want to, I don't, maybe I should just leave, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay, don't, don't think about it. No, what I'm saying is that I continued the meal because I thought that I bit it. So I ate with the, the whatever. I, I said, what is going on? Another night. I was asleep on the bed. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. <laughs> so this time, I decided not to get up. Just reached my hand on the bed. I turned on the light. My God. No, this is where the joke even ends. Even it's traumatic for me now. You know, I saw huge rats, huge, cat like rats, cat rats on the. I saw two on the kitchen counter. I'm coming. One on the floor in the middle of the room. They all tend to look at me when I turn on the light. And then I saw two or three on the bed with me on the. On the there was a presence, I was not alone. But you know what happened? When the light came on, everybody ran away and disappeared. Because you see, all the demons and the devils in your life, all the demons of pornography, alcohol, all the addictions, demons of depression, demons of chains, and demons that will not let you go. All those demons. They're all just waiting for somebody to turn on the light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that believeth in me shall never walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. How can I keep it to myself? How can I keep it to myself? How can we be a church that doesn't reach out? How can you work next to somebody at work? Your computer is next to the person. You've been working with the person for six months, one year, two years, three years, and you've never told them, can I just share a short verse with you? The scripture says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. You see, my friend, Patrick, unless you count your days, you'll be typing. Unless you count your days, you'll never be wise. You know, Job said, the wisdom of he that was about to perish fell on me. You know, when you know that your life is not forever, you think in a certain way. I mean, Patrick, think about it now. If, if this was our last day on earth and we were all told that we're about to be shot if an armed robber came here, God forbid, and he said, we should all send a text home. What are we going to think about? The main thing that will be on our minds is how we spend eternity. You know, Patrick, that's why I believe in God. That's why I go to church. And you push the keyboard away. You know, Patrick, all jokes aside, I feel in my heart that I should tell you. Jesus really loves you. I want you to know that he loves you. You know, one day, I just remember something. One day, one of my work colleagues, his name was Jeremy. I will not mention his name, but his name was Jeremy. He came to work with a red face and pimples. He had eaten KFC. The whole night. He told me, I've been eating KFC, walking from a pub. He said, I drank from when we closed work till the morning. He came to shower at work, wore his tie, and he came to work crying. And I, I was first at work, 5.30 or 6 a.m. I was there, and he was there, and he was crying at his desk. I always remember. He said, Jeremy, what is wrong? What's happening? What is it? He said, his second wife is leaving him. His second wife, the second time. He's living and he's not even allowed to go home. And I said, why? He said, because I'm an alcoholic. It's my fault. I'm, I can't help it. I'm an alcoholic. I drink. I can't stop. I remember feeling the sorrow in my heart. And I remember telling him, Jesus loves you. No, I didn't have anything to say. I just said, Jesus loves you. And I told him, the Bible says that God so loved the world. I remember the question, do you think that Jesus likes me as an alcoholic? As I am now. You think that Jesus likes me? He said, Jesus loves you. Jesus
Jesus loves. You know, some people are waiting for you to tell. You know, he, he wept when I told him Jesus loves. He cried and cried. After that, he came to tell me that if I ever tell anybody in the office that I saw him crying or that he prayed with me, he'll kill me. Because he used to always make fun of Christians. He told me, if you tell anyone, I'll kill you. Yeah, but that day I led him to Jesus Christ. I led him, I said, pray after me. Oh, yes. God is counting on you. God is counting on you. To tell somebody, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Prepare. One day I was on a train, I told somebody, prepare to meet your God. And he said, what do you mean? I said, no. He said, because he was telling me how he had come on the train and he had not brought food, so he didn't want to buy the train food because it's expensive and it's not even nice. And I, I brought out my food and I told him, prepare to meet your God. He said, what do I mean? I said, no, you came, I came prepared for this train ride. You didn't come prepared. I said, that's how death and eternity are. You are not prepared. I'm prepared. He said, if this train never reaches its destination and we all end up at the judgment seat of Christ, are you prepared to meet your God? And he was quiet. So I gave him, I gave him a flyer. I said, I'll see you in church. I said, I'll see you in church tomorrow. He was quiet, very quiet. And he showed up in church and he said, you know, God is counting on you. If only, you. but he says that you have to be skilled. God wants you to be somebody who is skillful with the word. The Bible actually talks about being skilled. Like you know which verse to use and how to speak to people. When I speak to students, tonight I'm going to preach in Lagos. When I preach to students, I can see that they are proud. One day I told, I went to a school, I told them, this is one of the worst universities in the world. This university, one of the worst. They were taking aback. back. Oh, oh. <laughs> I said, you are so proud as I'm talking to you. I said, what I'm saying doesn't uh, matter to you. I told them, I'm more educated than you. All of you here, bring your degrees. I told them, I have a number of postgraduate degrees. Bring yours, postgraduate, post, after graduation. I told them, all quiet. I told them, God called me because of people like you. You think you are so. They gave their lives to Christ. Be they all lifted up their hands humbly. Oh, yes. God is counting on you. God is counting on you. He's counting on you. The light of the world. All the demons. I don't know who you know who has demons in their life. What they need is Jesus. They don't need counseling. They don't need somebody to talk to them. They don't need to watch a TV show. They don't need to read a book by Dr. Phil. They need Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You know, I tell you, me, I grew up in church, so I know the difference between going to church and becoming a Christian. When Jesus lives in your heart, the hope of glory, the hope of glory, the light of the world. And finally, finally, as I close, we preach Christ because he's the resurrection and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. No, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He that, Jesus actually promised us that anyone who follows him, even though you were dead, yet you shall live. And then he went on to say, and he that believeth in me shall never die. You'll never die. The resurrection and the life. Truly the greatest curse in the world is death. That's, that's what God told Adam. The day you eat this thing, you'll die. That's the biggest problem a person can have is that you will die. There are few things that can over surmount that one. That's why hell is wild. Because death, hell is the second death, like the death too. It's quite strong. And you know the scripture says that don't fear God who can kill the body and then he follows you into the spirit world and also kills the second. Wow, that's somebody to be afraid of. Yes. But Jesus told Mary, do you know why Jesus wept? John eleven thirty five, 35, famous verse. You know why he cried? I didn't know why he cried. Recently I learned why he cried. Jesus cried. You know, people say, ah, but he was going to raise the dead. Jesus cried because Lazarus was dead. And for someone to die before the cross, you see, death without the cross is cause for weeping. But Jesus had not yet died on the cross. And to die without the hope of salvation was enough to bring Jesus to tears. That Lazarus will spend time wherever he went to spend time without the, the benefit of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wept. And Jesus weeps for everyone here who doesn't know Jesus. He weeps for you. The Bible says he wept over the city. He said, you don't know the things that belong to your peace. He cries for the whole world. To die without the cross is serious. Because hell is real. And death truly is the big curse. Billy Graham called it the big statistic. The great unknown. Because 
hundred percent will die. Everybody here will die. That's why it's the big statistic. Hundred percent. Not everybody here will be rich. Not everybody here will be educated. Not everybody will be a boy. Not everybody will be a girl. Not everybody will have shoes. Not everybody will marry. Not everybody will have a child. Not everybody will go to America. Not everybody, but everybody will die. Big statistic. And when we die, hell. We all deserve hell. If we fight for our rights, we'll be in hell. If we say, like, leave us. eh, My friend. So then why does the Bible say this great curse is a blessing? It says, blessed are those who die. That's what the Bible says. The death is a blessing. But then he explains that blessed are those who die in the Lord. Revelation 14. Blessed are those who die. When you die in the Lord, death becomes a blessing. That's why Paul said, I'm, I'm stuck between the two. I don't know whether to be here or to be there. But when Paul says, why well, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which we cannot see are eternal. And then he says that we know that if this earthly uh, temp- tabernacle was dissolved, we have another one in the heavens. A house not made with hands. Eternal in the heaven. Do you have a house to move to? Do you have a place to stay? Do you have somebody you can stay with when you die? Where are you going to stay? The resurrection and the life. I have been to many funerals. You know, once I actually went to a funeral in the UK. And I placed my hand on the coffin. I really wanted to see. But I didn't want people to know. So we were all going past the coffin. So when I got there, I put my hand on the person's thigh. I said, in the name of Jesus, rest of I opened my eyes to see. So that it's not working, so I just left. Because it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. No, raising the dead is something else. The de- for somebody to die. For somebody to die. You know, one of the world's biggest religions, the, the, the leader, the progenitor, when he was dying, his last words were, where I go, I know not. Like, where I'm going. I wouldn't like to follow somebody who doesn't know where they're going. Yeah. One day I was following Bishop Potasso, I asked, do you know where you're going? He said, he doesn't know where he's going. Yeah. I wouldn't like to follow somebody who doesn't know where he's going. But the person that I'm following, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Then he even described the place. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Oh, yes. Where, my, where, where the person I'm following, he knows where he's going. So I'm ready. Me, I'm ready for judgment. Too. I'm excited about judgment. Because, you know, in court, I'm a lawyer in court. When there's a criminal case, there you plead, there are two options. Plead guilty or not guilty. Guilty or not guilty. Um, Your Honor, uh, Mr. John, John in cancer has been charged with murder in the second degree. John, Mr. John, man, cancer, how do you plead? Not guilty, my lord. Yeah. Okay. Waive the rights, but not the reading. Okay. Next, found he uh, has been charged with uh, uh, manslaughter. He has been charged with grievous bodily harm. He has been charged with assault in the second degree. He has been charged with fraud. He has been charged with a, a, a misdemeanor. Okay. Not guilty or guilty. Now, this, you and I, we don't want to stand at that judgment seat. On earth, you have two options. Guilty or not guilty? When they ask you, are you guilty of theft? Guilty or not guilty? Now, when you say not guilty, you are a liar. When you say guilty, you are going to hell. What do you say? And you are in a place where the truth is being revealed. You, how many girls' hearts have you broken? Lois, Joanna, Gwendolyn, and Judith. <laughs> how many girls? Jack, how many girls? Guilty or not guilty? If you say guilty, you go to hell. If you say not guilty, everybody knows the truth is everywhere. You don't even have to ask you. Guilty or not guilty? But you see, when you know Jesus, there's a third, there's a third option. I plead the blood. To me, that, that's what I'm waiting for. Just, I'm, not, I'm not worried at all. Hey, Joshua, how many girls' hearts have you broken? I plead the blood. Hey, Joshua, you were seen at... I plead the blood. Hey, Joshua, you stop. I plead the blood. I'm just waiting. At the point, I'll even ask the angels, how do you want to mention all so that I'll say the blood after? 
I'll even be telling them, I'll summarize. I'll be telling them that, do you want me to answer? You left out some. I am a sinner. But the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ is washing me. The blood, I plead the blood. The cross, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Though he were dead, though he were dead. Billy Graham said, one day you'll see it in the news. Billy Graham has died. He said, don't believe a word of it. I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The resurrection and the life. I don't know anyone else who has overcome death. No, Jesus has overcome death in four stages. See, when, when Jairus' daughter was dying, her father ran out. She was still alive when he left home. Mm -hmm. While he was talking to Jesus and trying to convince Jesus to come and heal his daughter, mm -hmm. somebody came from the house to tell him that she just died. Okay. And Jesus went there and went to raise her from the dead. That's just died. When he went into the room, the people were crying. So he told that everyone should leave the room except me and her. Because sometimes some things don't get solved until you are alone in the room with Jesus. Oh yes, until you are alone with the Lord. So she was alone. Then he just came out with her and said, give her something to eat. Everybody was watching. That just died. Then died for a few days. He, went, he met the widow of Nain. And there was a long funeral procession and they were carrying the coffin. And there was a widow crying. You know, I've seen that before, especially in Mampo. You see them walking slowly with the coffin. Crying, crying. And Jesus came, he saw the woman. Put the coffin down. You know, I'm telling you, I've done one or two miracle services. I'm telling you, some things you have to take your time. Put the coffin down. It's better that the coffin is in the service and you are generally praying than you hope for the best. But put the coffin down. It means everybody, if there's a drone, the drone will come and focus on exactly on where the coffin is. They just say, put it down. Everybody gathered around. Then he came and touched. I don't know what the beer is. What is what? Yes, yeah, uh, the bed on which the body lies. That's why we come to church to learn every day. So he came to touch the bed, and all those who were carrying him stood still. Young man, do you know what it takes for your voice to be heard in the spirit? You have to call back the spirit from Abraham's bosom. Do you know the authority it takes to transport a man's spirit from where it is to come back? Young man, I say unto you, arise. 15. And he, he that was dead, he sat up. He sat up in the coffin. I don't think if me, I would, I would like to be that guy's friend, mom. I don't know whether he's dead or alive. What has he, what, where is he, where has he been? <laughs> he just woke up. How scary. Then Jesus did dead and buried. That's Lazarus. Lazarus after burial. By now he stinketh, the Bible says. Rotting. And Jesus stood outside. And he lifted. Well, that's how you know that Jesus is the, great, he's the Lamborghini of pastors. He lifted his hand and said, I thank you, Father, for what you have already done. It's more for these people. You know, I said, I'm telling you, I've done some one or two miracles. I'm just telling you that it's very risky. This way of speaking here, more of have faith, God can do anything type of preaching. But to say, I know that this dead body, you have already lifted him from the grave. But because of the service, I just want the people to see that I'm praying to you. But I know that you have heard me. It's a serious prayer to pray. Then he shouted and said, Lazarus, come forth. Then suddenly Lazarus. And they rolled the stone away. And Lazarus came out with the, 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 the uh, bandages around him. What a scary sight. You think that this is all that he has to do with death. Then he said, no. Maybe you people think that it's only when I raise other people that it works. So he said, now I myself am going to die. And I'm going to set an alarm clock for three days. I will sleep. When I'm tired of death, I'll wake up. So he went to sleep. He gave himself on the cross. And on the third day, the alarm clock rang in the spirit. And he just sat up, started folding his clothes. He's the master of death. And the whole of Accra if they die without Jesus, there's no hope against the great enemy death. But with Jesus Christ in your heart, the Bible says he is the resurrection and the life. 
everyone I know who died in the Lord, I'll see them again. I'll smile with them again. I'll laugh with them again. I'll shake hands with them. I'll speak to them. But those who died without Jesus, hi, my God, even now as we speak, where the worm dieth not. Hell is serious. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. Are you ready for heaven? Are you ready for the next life? You know, I tell this story and I close. I was going to catch a train to another country to go and I was going for church when I was when I was some years ago. And I was late from work. And the train was I think 6:20. And I managed to leave work at 5:30. I rushed home, threw things in the bag, suit, tie for church, everything to a bag. I grabbed my bag and I ran to the train station. I had to take one train, another train before I bought my train. So on the train, when I got there, then the, the lady told me that you are late. I knew her because she's regularly late. So she knew of me. She said, you are late. I don't think you're going to make it. I told her you can make a way. You can. I know you can make a way. Then she told me, this is the last time. She says that every week. This is the last time. So, okay. so she took me, held up the immigration, took me. We went through security. They checked me for metal, checked my bag, took out my laptop, my phone. Then we went through and we got to immigration. Then the immigration officer had closed. And she went to talk to him and he came back and came to sit down because of this lady. Then they told me, okay, so your passport. I'll never forget i never forget. I've held up the whole train. I was prepared to preach. I prepared to sleep. I had pajama. Prepared to preach with tie and suit. I prepared to read and pray. I've taken speak, Bluetooth speakers with earphones and iPads and books. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to travel. You see, you may be prepared for university. You may be prepared to work. You may be prepared to marry. You may be prepared to have a child. But are you prepared to meet your God? Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? Or when you get to heaven, you say, okay, everything right. Where is Jesus? Left him out of my life. This why Philip went down into Samaria and preached Christ. And this is why the first love church is going to be a crusade church. Oh yes, I'm talking to you directly. Because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I pray for you that God will make you an evangelist. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you'll be witnesses for me. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Please stand to your feet. I just want us to pray for the Lord to make us witnesses. Just lift your hands wherever you are. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands. Pray that the Holy Spirit will make you a witness. Wherever you live, whoever you work with, whichever family you belong to, witnesses. 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 Oh, pray for the Holy Spirit. 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 Pray for the anointing. Pray for the Holy He changes you into a witness. He empowers you to witness. Pray for the Holy Spirit. 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 Pray for the anointing. Pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit on your life. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you. Oh, Holy Spirit, follow me. You know, listen. Listen, two seconds, two seconds. Listen. You know, last year, at the end of the year, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He told me that, you know, I'm backsliding in my soul winning. I said, God, are you serious? I've organized crusades. I've organized the church has been having outreaches. And he said, no. There's no reward 
for organization. It's not, it's not about organizing. He told me, you, yourself, are you a soul winner? You know, I met an evangelist there. Eh? And I met an evangelist and two evangelists. And then a senior evangelist who was working for this evangelist. Don't worry, you forget about it. Two evangelists. And they were a team. And there was a, like a bodyguard type of helping guy around this evangelist recently. And I asked, the guy shook my hand and introduced himself. And I asked him, so what do you do? Then the evangelist, the younger evangelist said, he's a soul winner. That's what he does. And I said, no, no, I mean, but actually in the organization, like, what do you do? Then the older evangelist said that there's none amongst us who has a job that is uh, above soul winning. Yeah, something, I, I don't remember how he put it, but it's like, there's no more important job for all of us. So I said, really? So like, he, he said, yes. When, he, when they go for a crusade, in the morning, they have that so-called bodyguard guy, he goes round to the small, small areas to go and have small crusades, 40 people, 100 people, 150 people, before the evening crusade, that's the bodyguard. You know, I felt the Lord telling me, you yourself, you Joshua, where are your salvation? Hey, so I'm on it, oh, I'm on it, I can't lie to you. I'm on the job, I'm on the job. You'll be a soul winner. And I pray for you that God will also speak to you personally that no, it's not about organizing or I paid for it or I, I helped to bring them or I did. No, 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 you yourself. That's all good, that's great. You have your reward in heaven. But I tell you, there's nothing like being a soul winner yourself. I tell you, converting many to righteousness. The scripture says, you shine, you shine, you shine, you shine. And I pray that God will make your life beautiful. He'll make your life shine, make your life wonderful. Why Philip preach Christ? Because he's the hope of glory. Because he's the light of the world. Because he's the resurrection and the life. Lift your hands. Let's pray one last time for the Holy Spirit to fall on us. And make this church into a witnessing church. A soul winning church. A church that's bringing people to Jesus Christ. Come on, lift your hands and pray for it. Pray for it. Pray for yourself. Don't pray for anyone. Pray for yourself. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Abra di benobri sanga jiva ne brosi pada maya doro bori agara baba maya di ne bosi agara baba ya doro bori agara baba Holy Spirit fall on your church Holy Spirit fall on your church You shall receive power You shall receive power You shall receive power After that the Holy Spirit has come on you and you'll be witnesses and you'll be witnesses and you'll be witnesses and you'll be witnesses Father we thank you for your power and your grace upon us this afternoon make this church Lord make, may us, make us nothing else but a soul winning church let this be what we are known for Lord that we walk with you and that we win many to come to know you in Jesus name I pray Amen every head bowed every eye closed maybe today you as you were hearing the word of God you realized you don't have the hope of glory you don't have the light of life you don't have the resurrection and the life Maybe you are like me, you grew up in a Christian family or you've always called yourself a Christian but in your heart, you know you are far from God. I gave my life to Jesus in a service just like this. You want to say, Pastor, I want to give my heart to him also. I want you to lift up your right hand where you are standing. I'll pray for you just like my pastor prayed with me all many years ago. Lift up your right hand high above your head. God will change your life. The hope of glory. No matter how messy your life is, no matter how messed up your life is, when Jesus comes into your heart, He gives hope for glory, for something beautiful, for something better, for something greater than where we are at at this time. Lift up your right hand high above your head. I need Jesus. Now if you've lifted up your hand, wherever you're sitting, whether it's upstairs, at the back, I want you to leave where you are sitting or standing and come all the way. Take your bag, your Bible, whatever you came with, your phone, and walk all the way to the front, to the altar. I want to pray with you. Come. He's the hope of glory. He'll make your life beautiful. He'll 
transform your life. He's the light of this world. He's the light of this life. He's the light that scares away the darkness. The Bible says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Come to Jesus, the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believeth in me shall never die. Come to Jesus. I surrender all. wants to save you. Come. Leave your seat and come. There are a few more of you. The Lord wants me to call you. Come, leave your seat. My sister, your life is a mess. But the Bible says he picks us out of the miry clay and he sets our foot on a rock to stand. Oh, Jesus wants to change your life. Oh, Jesus wants to save you. Oh, he'll turn your life all around. He did it for me. He'll do it for you. He changed my heart. He changed my life. He'll change your life too. My brother, my sister, God bless you. Keep coming. Leave your seat at the back, under the balcony. In the far corners, Jesus is calling you. He's speaking to you. Upstairs, you need Jesus Christ. Come. He's calling you. He wants to save you. He wants to love you. He wants to transform your life. God bless you. God bless you. All right, bow your heads. Church, bow your heads as well. Those of you in front, bow your heads. Everybody, repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Write my name in the book of life so that one day I can come to heaven to be with you. Say, Satan. Everybody say, Satan. I will no longer serve you. I will no longer follow you. Say, from today, I am born again. I have a new life. Say, thank you, Lord. Saving me or changing my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Now, listen. We've taken a really important decision here this afternoon. But from here, you're going back to your room, your friends, your music, your life, whatever you've been doing. And it's not easy to overcome this world because you are likely to fall back, right back to where you were, even though you've taken a very important decision today. But this is just the beginning. And the Bible says, uh, this is the victory that overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So the only way to overcome the world is by faith. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Put it up again. Put up that scripture. This is the victory that overcomes the world. So your world will be overcome by your faith. Amen. Are you listening to me? But faith only comes by hearing the word of God. So from today, every Sunday, we meet here at 12 o'clock. It doesn't mean somebody has to bring you by bus. However you come, you have to come and hear the word of God every week. As the word of God enters you, faith grows in your heart and you overcome the world. You overcome the temptations of the world and the evil that is in the world. And God is going to keep you until the end. Those of you in front, say amen. Okay, it's good. You've understood me. Wonderful. Can you see my pastor there? I don't know why he's wearing a backpack. I think it makes him feel nice. So, but he's, he's a good pastor, don't worry, in spite of the backpack. He's going to give you a gift and talk to you for a few seconds and you'll be right back with us. Please follow him right there. God is going to change your life. We have a gift for you. We have pro to want to pray with you. Want some, we have something to share with you. And I know your life will never be the same again. Please put your hands together for all these wonderful people who have given their hearts to Jesus. Hi. Thanks for watching the First Love Church YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this message, then please take a minute to hit the subscribe button on your screen and that way you won't miss a single message. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe.